proud of the effort you put in. Y'all are going to do great. Don't worry about it. All right. So, Oswaldo, I don't know. Have y'all practiced where you're going to stand? Oswaldo, when you're ready, and I'll start the timer on your first word. Okay, sir? Yeah. Hello. I am Jose de Hoyos. And to start things off, I'd like you to do me a favor. On a piece of paper, or just in your head, write down the first things that come to mind when you see this man. It can be words or phrases. Create a backstory if you want. Okay, now do the same for this woman. Write down your opinion. Now, for either of those people, did you write down veteran, war hero? Did the word military even cross your mind? If it did, then congratulations. Unfortunately, I do not have a prize, but I can give you bragging rights. However, without meaning to, we view the homelessness problem with a stigma. We filter in our heads how we decide to see these people, and it causes us to cycle solutions. The culture and community surrounding the homeless lifestyle is seen as playing a significant role in how the individual copes with their homelessness. This is from a senior thesis written by Caitlin Phillips. The thesis went in and broke down homelessness, causes, the people who make up the population, and the culture of the homeless. Homelessness is not something we are unfamiliar with. It exists all over the world. According to the Homeless World Cup Foundation, in 2019, Nigeria had 24.4 million homeless. Honduras faced a housing deficit of over a million units. And in Canada, 70% of homeless struggle with some sort of mental illness. Looking at the US, we see that California has the biggest number of homeless. Of these people, 37,085 of those people are better. This information comes from the US Department of Veteran Affairs. Now, we have all the numbers and all this information, but what do we do with it? Well, we look at what makes up these numbers. Looking back at the thesis previously mentioned, we see that it is mental illness that really affects the homeless. This shows that from the homeless who were reported and discharged from a hospital, 15.7% of the people had some sort of mental illness afflicting them. Now, this is just reported from the hospital alone. These are just two articles that showed that San Francisco was recognizing there was a problem with mental health in the homeless. They decided to shift their focus. They are trying to answer the same question that we are. How can we better treat mental illness among the urban homeless? I want to specifically look at the homeless veteran population. Now, I had said that approximately 37,000 people in, the, in 2019 were homeless veterans, and most veterans have some form of PTSD. This is due to veterans experiencing culture shock. Now, by definition, a culture shock is the feeling of disorientation experienced by someone who is uh, suddenly subjected to an unfamiliar culture, way of life, or set of attitudes. Veterans are thrown back into civilian life with city lights, noises, and a plethora of things they have to get used to, and it throws them out of balance. The sudden change from war culture to civilian life leaves them unable to cope and can lead to them becoming homeless. Now, some veterans do have the support they need and often don't have to worry about facing homelessness. However, majority shows that not enough people have the resources to actually transition properly. So, what I propose is nature-based therapy upon return of active duty veterans. San Francisco is already changing its way of thinking and looking into therapy options to help mentally ill. I propose going to help veterans first, not only because they are large in numbers, but they are also one of the easiest to help. From 2018 to 2019, there was a 2.1% increase in the homeless veteran population. The reason that it would be easiest to help veterans is first is because veterans mostly face two problems, physical disability and mental health. Now, Mental health is the better problem to tackle, not only because it helps PTSD, but because the homeless population has a large majority of mentally ill people. If we are able to successfully help veterans, we can apply our solution to the rest of the homeless. To give some depth, nature therapy is when we put those with issues, such as PTSD or some other mental illness, and we immerse them in nature. 
allowing, allowing them to participate in outdoor activities such as gardening. And the results are very promising. Sending them to nature takes out most of the culture shock because they don't have to get so used to civilian life so quickly. They can take time to adjust and allow themselves to get used to a different lifestyle. This is one of those places, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the, this is one of those places that already employs nature-based therapy with those with PTSD. Each one of these numbers shows a place where veterans chose to go to so they can adjust themselves by themselves. This garden is in Copenhagen and is called Nacadia. Nacadia saw that the patients would often go to the mammoth tree, number three in the picture, to feel secure and hugged while they sat underneath the branches. Or they would go to the greenhouse, number four, to occupy their time or to remember what it felt like to be in a room safe and without fear. The patients often seclude themselves and they are allowed to. And when they feel safe, they assimilate themselves back into the society in the garden. This is from a study done in Acadia and what they observed from the veterans. During the private time, part of the therapy program, the veterans preferred being alone at the beginning of the nature-based therapy. But later, some of the veterans showed the bonfires at the locations they felt more comfortable in. The veterans seemed to seek a connection between the characteristics of the nature setting and the location of their choice and their mental state. They sought out mental matches in the therapy garden or in the arbitorium. The study found that the garden was able to help veterans with PTSD. And after only a year in nature therapy, they were able to leave and continue their own nature devices for relaxation. And they all managed to recover. In America, there are nature-based therapy associations and programs in place, but most of them only step in when the veterans have already crashed in society. And many require money to put a person into the program. However, they all see improvements and recovery with the veterans that go into the program. One such program is Project Healing Water Fly Fishing. They have programs in all 50 states of America and use fly fishing as a tool of recovery. If we can use these techniques and lower the homeless population with veterans, we will be able to use these on the other mentally ill in the homeless population. From then, we could shift our focus all on mentally ill and dramatically decrease the homeless population. Thank you for listening. I'm Jose de Hoyos. And I urge you to consider this the next time you think about helping the homeless. Woo! Seven twenty-four, man. That's that was awesome. Great Thank job, Ricardo. Very proud for you and of you. Thank you. My watch here. Um, you have an audience, and I will start it on your first word. And remember, I won't stop you at all. I'll give you a signal if you hit eight minutes. Okay. Um, I know you're going to do great. Breathe and knock it out of the park, brother. Good morning. My name is Frank Davis, and I'm a junior at Carnes High School. Today, I'm going to present to you a solution to one of America's greatest problems, mental illness in the homeless community. Now, I'd like you to imagine something. Imagine your Thanksgiving lunch. You have fresh turkey, sweet potatoes, dressing, carrots, broccoli, and maybe even a little bit of your grandmother's coveted pumpkin pie. Now I'd like you to imagine a second scenario. It is also Thanksgiving lunch, but you're only hoping to get a meal. You're a Gulf War veteran who's currently unemployed, no family, sleeping on the streets of San Francisco, and hoping someone will spare you a couple of dollars to get a fast food meal. It's sad, right? So terribly sad, yet so terribly real. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development estimates that there are an astounding 553,000 742 people in the United States experiencing homelessness on any given night. America's Department of Housing and Urban Development also reported that 250,000 or 45 percent of those experiencing homelessness struggle with mental illness and another 140,000 or 25 percent live with serious mental illness. There's a crisis in the homeless community. Approximately seven out of ten homeless people struggle with mental illness in the United States but what about the rest of the world? Yale reported that no less than 150 million people, or about 2% of the world's population, are homeless. At this rate, we have 105 million homeless people living with mental illness. This is roughly the entire populations of Germany and Australia combined. Now, it is important to define what constitutes mental illness in order to treat it. The Mayo Clinic defines mental illnesses, disorders that affect your mood, thinking, and behavior. 
This is obviously a wide range of disorders. So let me give you a few examples. Depression, anxiety related disorders, schizophrenia, eating disorders, and substance abuse and addiction are all common types of mental illness within the homeless community. Now I'd like to pause and shift focus for a second. I'm going to bring you back to that Thanksgiving lunch, except with a different spin. You're enjoying your family meal and are about to begin watching some football in your living room. No one at your family meal is left hungry and no one is left on the street. In fact, it is quite the opposite. You begin to say things like, I'm never going to eat again. While this statement is harmless and it is in fact one I've made myself, the reality of the situation is that every year in the United States, a tremendous amount of food is wasted over the Thanksgiving holiday. The New York Post reported that every year an estimated $277 million of food is wasted over the Thanksgiving holiday alone. Food waste and mental illness are two drastically different issues, but I'm here to tell you they're a lot more connected than you think they are. A Canadian study found that there is a clear association between food insecurity and mental health. Food insecurity is defined by the United States Department of Agriculture as a limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate or acceptable foods in socially acceptable ways. The Canadian study's authors concluded that the prevalence of food insecurity was extremely high in a cohort with long-standing homelessness and serious mental illness. The study proves that there is a link between poor mental health and food insecurity. It notes that homeless people are disproportionately affected by food insecurity and food insufficiency. Another study by Charles W. Smith cites nutritional deficiencies in, as an environmental threat to mental health. It would seem impossible to combat your depression and anxiety when you're having to worry about feeding yourself simultaneously. I mentioned to y'all earlier that $277 million of food is wasted over the Thanksgiving holiday, but this is only the tip of the iceberg. The Feeding America organization reports that each year 72 billion pounds of food goes to waste, while 37 million Americans struggle with hunger. That is the equivalent weight of 350 Nimitz class aircraft carriers and over 60% of the 13,000 mile Great Wall of China. Now it shouldn't take an entire wall's worth of food to give those within the homeless community a stable environment to deal with their mental illness. The Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority estimated it will cost them nearly $2.1 billion to house the roughly 60,000 homeless over the next five year period. Therefore, with a 10 to 15% reduction in food waste, the American taxpayer could house and feed all the homeless people in the United States. The cost benefits of saving otherwise wasted food are astronomically and overwhelmingly positive. The 10 to 15% reduction in food waste I just mentioned is worth roughly $33 billion. According to statistics provided by the Feeding America organization, the average cost of a meal is $2.94. By the same logic, it would cost $8.82 for a day's worth of food and $3,219 for a year's supply. When you stretch this individual figure out for those experiencing homelessness on any given night, you find a shocking revelation. With this proposed 10 to 15% reduction in food waste, those going to sleep homeless could be fed for over 18 years by a small tweak to the average American's lifestyle. The Feeding America organization has done a lot of great things for not only the homeless population, but hungry Americans as a whole. Their application, Meal Connect, has currently recovered over 1.86 billion pounds of food. Their application simply connects donors, such as grocery stores and restaurants, to local food pantries. You simply post the food on your mobile phone or desktop through the Meal Connect system, and it will match you with your local food bank. In addition, Meal Connect notifies you once your excess food is connected and picked up by your local food bank. This simple process can definitely save many, many more billions of pounds of food, and it can give those in the homeless community struggling with mental illness a safe environment to do so. The application can facilitate a whole new life for those in the homeless community. America is at a crossroads, with 70% of its homeless population struggling with mental illness. While I don't stand here and pretend that giving homeless people proper nutrition is going to solve their homelessness, or even their mental health. Eliminating this aspect of a homeless person's struggle will drastically improve their circumstances and state. Solving food insecurity gives those fighting homelessness a stable environment to deal with their mental health problems. How can we as a society expect someone to deal with their heroin addiction when they cannot even afford fast food?
The answer is that we can't expect someone to change or cope with their mental health problems until we change and afford them in, afford them in a stable environment to do so. Thank you. Wow, right at seven, brother. Good job, good job, good job. Boom. All right, I'm going to stop the recording there.